Activision Blizzard, it's a gaming company, their stock ticker symbol ATVI, a really interesting company. There's a lot of positives, sadly also a lot of negatives, possibly built into the price of the stock. This thing could really move in two directions. And we're gonna have to discuss the fundamentals, where the problems are, and possibly once those problems slightly clear themselves, you know, it might be a really good time to invest. Uh, and hopefully over the next few parts, we'll kind of get a really good uh, vision of what's going on with the company. So you can see in the past 10 years, the stock has really moved, you know, from $10 to almost $100. So almost uh, giving someone 10 times the returns. So that's really positive. It does not mean that everything's over. There is really a lot of room for this stock to move. But uh, just in terms of the technicals, you know, if someone wants to get in uh, soon, sooner than later, um, you know, it's not really something I do. So, you know, by the way, everything I'm going to say is just for entertainment value, of course. Take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, I'm not a professional. I'm doing this for myself and just trying to help everyone else along. Um, so, you know, if this stock, for example, goes below, you know, that $88 uh, support, which it was very close to recently, um, it could easily go down another five, six, seven dollars to the eighty-four dollar level of support. You know, these are really simple technical terms. I don't know if it will. I don't know if it won't. But uh, something to keep in mind that if it does go down, it could go down quite a bit uh, before having a chance to rebound up. But once again, let's look at the fundamentals because that's something I'm not saying I'm an expert at, but definitely have <laughs> a lot more knowledge and a lot more confidence in. Okay. So let's look at the revenue. We can see there's a big bounce in revenue in 2016. That was because Activision Blizzard uh, bought uh, what's called King Games. They are the makers of Candy Crush and a few other games, I'm sure, as well. Uh, I don't remember the titles. They're much smaller. But quite a large purchase, and they obviously bring in quite a lot of revenue, you know, an extra billion dollars. So that was a very impressive purchase. And you can see it was going up, you know, 2017, 2018, and then there was a drop in 2019, which we'll get to. In terms of the cost of goods sold, you can kind of see it, it matches revenue. So as revenues go up, you know, cost of goods is sold uh, can also go up. Uh, even though, once again, interestingly enough, um, King Games is not selling hard copies, but there's still going to be costs in terms of development and uh and developers of these games and maintaining them, things like that. So something to keep in mind, you know, it's it's not as much as we tend to think as uh, technology businesses as a low cost of goods, you know, there's still an enormous amount of marketing, an enormous amount of development and all these other uh, parts of the business. So sadly, it's not going to be something where it's a uh, low cost of goods sold, of course. Okay, so when it comes to the gross profit, it's very good that it's matching the revenues. You know, that's a good sign. Uh, operating expenses, once again, very close, although you see in 2018 there was a little bit of a drop in operating expenses. And I think in 2018 they actually let go quite a few employees. I can't imagine that that resulted in this drop in terms of operating expenses, but, you know, we'll have to get into it. And, um, you know, it's those types of actions that the business makes that can help them reduce operating expenses. Not saying it's a good idea, but it's something that will affect the numbers, of course. Okay, in terms of pre-tax income, so you can see, interesting, in, interestingly enough, although 2016, 2017, those years had quite a lot of revenue, uh, the pre-tax income is, is, is not that high, you know. So that's not a good sign, of course. And it might be why in 2018 the stock fell so much, you know. The lack of income that was really being generated by the company and um, it possibly, I mean, we'll get into it more in the year over year, you know, issues they were having. Although it's certainly the stock in terms of fundamentals and the stock in terms of its price has bounced back quite a bit. So, uh, you know, the fundamentals matter, of course. You know, in my opinion, obviously I'm biased. But nevertheless, you can see it here. And income after taxes, very similar to pre-tax income in terms of those numbers, although 2017 now is doing really poorly. Okay, but in terms of cash flow from operating activities, you know, I found this fascinating. 2017 was actually a great year, and it was really 2018, 2019, which, uh, you know, paled in comparison. So the question is, you know, what's going on in terms of the cash flow from operating activities? Uh, but just to be clear what cash flow is in just a simplified sense, you know, it's just the money coming in versus the money going out. Um, and so 2018 just didn't have 
as it had too much money going out or not enough coming in, whatever the case may be, because we saw the pre-tax income was higher than 2017. So presumably 2017, they just simply lost a lot less money. Okay, in terms of goodwill and intangible, intangible assets, you can see in 2016, it jumped up quite a bit. Uh, you know, that's obviously because they bought King Games and King Games, they quote unquote, paid more than what the company was generating. And so it gets lumped into goodwill and intangible assets, something I actually dislike because it skews the asset sheet. Obviously, people who know what they're doing, you know, can obviously look past it, but it does open um, it does open up the company to be tempted to commit, I wouldn't say fraud, <laughs> but manipulating the numbers. And w one reason is because if a franchise, for example, uh, in this case, King Games, uh, doesn't deliver on what they paid for it so then you have to devalue that franchise right you have to say oh we paid you know we thought this was worth six billion and turns out now it's really worth five and you can see it's going down and down and down is that because of king games is that because of something else in activision blizzard obviously I can't tell exactly but it doesn't really matter the point is something is going down in terms of its intangible value right people if if activision blizzard wanted to sell that company they may not be able to actually sell it for what they paid for it uh, although people are saying that it was a good deal and so and we'll explain why even if it is going down in value i think it is still a good deal nevertheless something is losing value and of course the fraud comes in because sometimes accountants or the ceo wants to devalue that asset even more than it should so that you stop devaluing it in future years you know all these little technicalities uh we'll probably have to do a video on exactly what goodwill is and how it should be used and not used. Nevertheless, not a great sign to see it going down because that means something in the company that they paid for is worth less today than it was yesterday because it wasn't performing as well as it should. Okay, in terms of cash on hand, it's actually a great sign. They have probably the most cash on hand since they've had in the past eight years. That's great. In terms of total current liabilities, so what are they gonna have to pay off in terms of debt in the next year? Well, uh, approximately 3 billion they have twice as much as that in terms of just cash on hand so you know that's easily that can easily pay that for a year or two and uh, in terms of everything going on in the world i don't think they're going to be strapped for cash simply because people are staying home they're playing games it would only be a real problem if people didn't have the money to pay for the games of course okay uh, in terms of total liabilities though they have 7 billion dollars in terms of uh, total liabilities and um you know, it jumped up in 2013, even more in 2017, but you know, they've been able to pay off $3 billion in a year. So that's actually a really good sign. And, um, you know, it means that they can handle the debt load. Obviously they have five and a half billion dollars in cash versus 7 billion in total liabilities. Uh, means they're probably doing okay and they'll probably have access to more capital if they have to delay some of these loans by borrowing more money to pay them off, which, whether you like it or not, that's a lot of companies do that. They roll their debt forward. Okay, uh, in terms of dividends, if anyone uh, is you know cares about that, um, I think it is somewhat important. In this case, not so much because you can see in terms of the stock price, especially. But the dividend payout is not an enormous amount. It's you know fifty cents, and so in terms of the yield right now, it's uh, quite small. It's you know 03 percent. I don't know the exact number, but you can see it's been going down quite a bit, and that's simply because the stock price has been going up quite a bit. But even at the beginning, it was only one percent yield. So you know it's not exactly a dividend stock. I think that's uh, pretty obvious from the look of it. But it's good to know that it does exist. I suppose. Okay, so now let's get more into, you know, the actual um, 10K and let's see what's going on. So first of all, you know, Activision Publishing, uh, their main call to fame is Call of Duty. Um, in terms of Blizzard Entertainment, you know, they have Battle.net, which is actually quite important. It allows them to do online gaming um, and do it well. They have World of Warcraft, they have Hearthstone, they have Overwatch. And of course, if you're familiar, they have other games like um, StarCraft, for example, StarCraft 2. Okay, in terms of King Digital Entertainment, we mentioned they have Candy Crush. So that's really what this company does best. These are the main games. They try and make other intellectual property, other types of games. And, uh, you know, they've been quite successful, I think, in terms of Hearthstone and Overwatch. Those are two somewhat recent games compared to World of Warcraft and Call of Duty, which are quite older games. 
Um, so, you know, I think that shows a lot of potential in the company. I think that's a really, really positive sign that they're not just stuck in terms of one exact game. And also what's important is these games are quite different. Uh, there is some overlap, of course. But in terms of, you know, compared Candy Crush to any of these games is extremely different, of course. And World of Warcraft is very different than Call of Duty. Okay, so now in terms of where are their products actually used, it's important to know, you know, they have the consoles and PC. There's also things like in-game content people can uh, buy for their games, uh, microtransactions, which I think is, you know, somewhat similar to in-game content as far as I can tell. Um, but there's also subscriptions that people have to pay to be able to play, you know, for example, World of Warcraft. So I think what's really important here, though, is not only are they on multiple devices, and we're going to talk, in fact, that they're also on phones as well, but they have in-game content, so they have that way of making money, microtransactions. Um, and, you know, I think that's very similar to the, to the same idea as in-game content. Um, but nevertheless, subscriptions is a very different type of business model because you're just paying to be able to play, not for additional things that you can get to play the game. Okay, so in terms of manufacturing, you know, I thought it was just interesting to see, you know, how they talk about the business in terms of the fact that they have third-party subcontractors that, uh, for example, might be required to be used in terms of making and distributing uh, the physical copy of the games. And same thing with, uh, you know, when it comes to Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, they might be uh, forced to have a replicator. You know, they give the game to them and then the manufacturer replicates it. Um, this has good and bad. I mean, in terms of the good side, it means they don't have to develop the technology and worry and buy all the machinery. And then there's a new game console. And then they have to worry about, you know, buying new machinery to be able to work for that new game console. Uh, you know, it, it bypasses all of that uh, expense. And so, you know, they're not left holding the bag if that game console doesn't do well. Instead, they're paying a replicator. And obviously, the replicator uh, gets a little bit of profit, of course. So it means they're paying a little bit more for each game. So, you know, some good and bad there. It's just something to be aware of. Now, just as a side note, uh, what's important to know is with uh, content being downloaded more and more and not actually having physical uh, distribution, uh, that might become less of an issue and less something to be concerned about it at all in any way. Okay, so in terms of intellectual property, they mentioned they are significantly dependent on the creation, acquisition, and protection of intellectual property, right? They see that as pretty much their core business, whether it's their trade secrets that help them develop and run our games. You know, in my personal opinion, uh, that might actually be somewhat important, but it's also something that could easily be outdone by a newer company. What do I mean? So for example, there's a lot of programming that goes on, for example, World of Warcraft to allow the whole world to run. And a lot of companies might actually have a lot of trouble having so many people concurrently in one world trying to play together and have it work well. Nevertheless, let's say game physics, game mechanics, they're going to include that as part of their trade secrets. Exactly how do they know that when a person, let's say, shoots uh, their weapon that the other person has been hit and that was correctly done, you know, that's game physics. That's something they developed themselves, presumably. They would call that a trade secret. To me, that's, although technically true, other people can develop, you know, the same types of algorithms, the same types of um, physics. And in fact, if they're starting their project later on, they'll have a better chance of doing it even better because they'll be not only able to look at what mistakes other people have done, but they'll have access to newer technology, better code, better libraries, all these other things to make the gun, uh, make the whole game run a lot more smoother. Uh, nevertheless, there's definitely some trade secrets that are probably of value, like I just said, Battle.net and how they detect people cheating, things like that um, might actually hold some value. But I think the most valuable part is actually intellectual property in terms of the games, the creation of them, and so the characters, the stories, all those types of things. I think that's far, far, far more valuable. Hopefully they would agree as well. So now we're going to get into some of the risks that they mention. And uh, I thought this page was actually really, really telling. So let's actually go through this properly. You know, they see a major problem is if they don't have popular, high quality content in a timely manner, you know, that could be a horrible thing for their company. And uh, or if their consumers prefer competitive products more. Now that sounds like that's very logical. But this is going to tailor their whole perspective on on how they build the business on how they develop games 
And I think it's really important because we're going to see how, you know, the company is really clashing with the players. And I think with stock investing, all these kind of things are really um, conflicting, I suppose, to really affect uh, Activision Blizzard in possibly not a good way. And we'll talk about that in a much later part. We can't, we can't get it all in now. But I think that this page is almost like the basis. It's almost like their perspective, you know, their side of the story. Okay, so, you know, for example, they think that games remain popular only for a limited period of time. And so they will start losing money if they don't have something. And that has to be new content, other enhancements, or a new version of the game, of course. And so they have to con continuously develop new products or get new content out there. There just can't be any slowdown in that regard. Um, they also see the fact that there's a chance that their own best-selling products could compete. Right? So they have to make them strategically different from each other. Not only that, but if there's negative reactions, right, that could also always affect their uh, company in terms of their sales. And of course, if there's delays in the product release or some other type of disruption, that could negatively affect everything as well. And this really, this page could summarize almost everything. I think all Activision Blizzard players, now I'm not one myself, um, so I can't really speak on this except that, you know, for this the research in terms of stock, you know, I have to look through news articles. I have to look through just a little bit uh, at what people are saying, the negative reviews, the positive reviews of things. And uh, I, I almost feel like this really speaks to it. And we will come back to it trying to incorporate what people's problems are with Activision Blizzard. But, you know, this idea that they have to continually keep moving things, new games, new content, there's all these bugs, people are upset that they're not getting a full game, you know, it's only parts of the game with later updates, you know, why can't I get the whole game right up front? Um, and then by the time there are those new content and new updates, maybe they've moved on, you know, they don't, you know, enjoy the game with, you know, coming with bugs and not all the things you can do. And it's just very boring to, or, uh, you know, for them. And, uh, you know, they might feel, for example, in terms of this next point about their best selling products competing, you know, they might feel you know, Call of Duty would be much better if it was this way. But the Activision Blizzard team might think, oh, well, if Call of Duty is that way and Overwatch is this way, you know, those two games could compete. And so, well, we can't have that. And so we have to make them different. Uh, I think that that might, there's a small chance that that might affect how they develop these games and how they go in each direction. Um, that might cause some conflicts. I'm not sure about that one exactly, but I think in the back of them, let's keep that one in the back of our minds when we discuss all the negative things people are having with Activision Blizzard because, you know, for example, negative reactions. People are really upset that the community moderators, they're not taking their uh, cue, you know, they're not taking their um, comments, they're getting banned, they're getting blocked or whatever it might be. Uh, and so these people who are paying customers and who maybe you'd call our influencers, right? They can't get their message out. They can't, you know, uh, get what they want in terms of Blizzard responding and explaining. And uh, Blizzard doesn't want to have all that negative, except it's a snowball effect because now the people get upset and they talk to other people publicly instead of directly to Blizzard and trying to make improvements uh, because Blizzard doesn't want that negative reaction at all. Now, not everyone in Blizzard and not everyone in Activision, so I'm, you know, but nevertheless, this is the way some people are feeling. And then furthermore, this delay in product releases, they're very nervous about that, you know, affecting their stock or the business or the gamers, except, you know, gamers tend, from what I see, to prefer that delay if it means they're going to have a much, much better game without all the bugs, without all these problems I just mentioned. Nevertheless, you know, Activision Blizzard is seeing this as a major hurdle. And I think one of the problems, for example, is if you're a stock investor, you know, you want to see your revenues in the company you have grow each year because you feel like the company is doing better and better. And that's how you know, you know, the company is bringing in more money. If there's a huge dip, how do you know that, that the next year won't also be a dip? And so in terms of investor confidence and in terms of the business, they feel like they have to continually bring in that revenue on a constant stream. They can't have any hiccups. A lot of companies are like this. And a lot of accounting allows for this kind of massaging of information to allow companies to kind of, um, I don't know, uh, make earnings move in a nice line instead of having those bumps and hiccups. And, you know, it's something 
to make investors really feel good and businesses to feel good. And But the problem is that's not always the way businesses work and it's not always the way their consumers want it. And I think that's a major problem in terms of Activision Blizzard, that that's the route they've decided to take, not the kind of honest route of, hey, we're going to have ups and downs. We're regularly going to go up and, and we'll prove that to you. Um, instead, they are producing titles every single year or whatever it may be to have some new revenue, some new growth, some new something to explain their stock. Um, and I think that's causing a lot of trouble with uh, customers. But nevertheless, we'll get to that in a later point. I think it's really important to mention now. Uh, but that's the way they see their company. And if they could really deliver on all of this, I actually think it might be a good thing. I just sadly think there's a lot of corner cutting to allow them to do this uh, and so you know they can speak to their investors oh we're releasing this now a new game next year and we're gonna have even more money and but they have to cut corners to do that and so maybe some of the consumers are pretty upset and how long can you really do that for uh, once again something to discuss later okay nevertheless they dispend on on very few franchises that, uh, you know, 67% of their revenues are from Call of Duty, Candy Crush, World of Warcraft. Uh, that's an enormous amount. And so if one of those goes down, has some very negative opinion, it could really, really hurt the company. Obviously, I think they're trying to expand their intellectual property, which is great. But at the moment, it's a little bit tricky. So something to watch out for. Can they expand that? Okay, so the next thing they mention are they have to be anticipating and adapting to emerging technologies. I don't think that's a big deal. Everyone has to do that. And yeah, there might be some hiccups along the way. Not something I'm really nervous about personally. Um, you know, they're talking about competitors being able to le leverage their greater financial, technical personnel and other resources. And I think this actually might be a little bit of a problem for them. I would say not so much. First of all, it's an S&P 500 company, Activision. I'm pretty sure anyway, but nevertheless, a very large company either way. Um, it's really the personnel part here that actually bothers me. They've had a little bit of a brain drain issue with people at the company leaving. Once again, we'll talk about that later. Later, uh, And obviously, they mentioned they have to compete with other forms of entertainment and leisure activities. Of course, right now, a lot of people are home. A lot of people are playing games. That's what they can do. And so right now, you're getting people involved in the games. You're going to see presumably a growth in these games uh, in next year. Sadly, that growth might evaporate, but nevertheless, you know, people are getting introduced to these games. They're having a lot more fun, presumably, with them, and so they're getting new customer bases. More people are trying different games, presumably, you know, just, you know, you can imagine how that'll happen, and so even if fewer people are playing, but it'll still grow them in a general sense from, you know, last year, for example. So I think this is actually a positive thing right now that people, at least for them, uh, it's positive that people can't necessarily have the all the other leisure and forms of act, uh, entertainment. But in general, I can see how that'll be a problem, especially once everyone are let out of lockdown. You know, it's possible that people will eschew games for a little bit and do all the other things that they were not allowed to. Okay, nevertheless, in terms of digital sales, so they mentioned an amazingly interesting thing here. Um, the fact that everything's moving towards uh, digital distribution channels. You know, we mentioned how clunky and difficult, you know, you know, making CDs or whatever the hardware content was. But now with digital, uh, you know, they're mentioning something that, you know, even if there's a small studio, it doesn't cost a lot of money to put yourself up on a digital platform like Steam or like a different content provider that's going to allow people to download these games to their Xbox uh, console. They don't have to do these massive deals with manufacturers, figuring out how to distribute to all the physical stores. Obviously, they still have a one-up, especially in emerging markets where maybe there are stores where, you know, whatever the case might be, uh, where that's the main way people get their content. But nevertheless, the world is moving towards digital and it means that there's going to be a, I wouldn't say leveling of the play field, but it, it will mean that other companies who produce good games because they're only paying developers, they don't have to worry about the distrib distribution channels. It's a lot less of a barrier to entry, I suppose. Nevertheless, they obviously have their foot in the door first. People are going to know their games. They're going to recognize the intellectual property. You know, World of Warcraft has a big name. Call of Duty has a big name. And so that, that really is now their barrier to entry, I suppose. Okay, so now they talk about, you know, uh, retail, sell, retail sales and the fact that there's only so much shelf space and promotional resources that can go around. But once again, just like I mentioned that barrier to entry, 
they mention the same thing about premium placements on websites. So they're a big company, they can buy the banner, they can buy, you know, the spot first on the row or whatever it might be to help their game, uh, you know, become one of the top games. And once it becomes a top game, well, it's top in a list of top games. And so people are more likely to play it. So there is still a barrier to entry in terms of money and these types of connections, I think. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how um, the interactive uh, entertainment software is going towards next generation consoles. And I think this is actually a really important point because when they are released, these next generation consoles, so people won't purchase as many games and because they're waiting for, you know, they've already bought this new version of Nintendo and they don't want to buy a game for an old console, so they get to wait and buy it for the new console. And there has been some talk about how Overwatch 2, one of their... Uh, releases is going to be a next generation console game and they've been delaying putting it out presumably next year it will be put out and people are quite upset about well it's not going to be so different than the first one but nevertheless if it is a for the next generation console whether it's new or different someone gets their next generation console they might want to play that game it might be a little bit more new maybe it's not new enough to really be called a new game right people are a little bit upset about that um Hopefully with the delay, they'll really be able to make it improved and different. But nevertheless, even if they can't, people might still just buy the game because they want to be able to play the game on their new console. And there's not so many new games. So uh, in terms of the timing, in terms of their development of, the, of that, I, I think actually makes a lot of sense. Hopefully it'll go well in terms of their stock and in terms of anyone who's an investor. You know, I don't wish anything bad upon anyone. <laughs> um, and so, you know, uh, but I think it's really important to understand how that type of mindset and that business acumen really has to work well with the development of the games and clearly they seem to have that type of strategy so i think that's a, a positive if the rumors of course are correct which you know it does seem like there is some basis okay nevertheless they mentioned they have a threat of unauthorized copying right that's a major risk obviously for any software but i think probably more is the modifications in my per, you know in my perspective and the reason is because people have these cheating programs, you know, bot, uh, bots, you know, that play the game for them and get them points, get them, you know, uh, skill and, and improve the game for themselves, but nevertheless make it much worse for other people because these guys are cheating. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the biggest problem for them. And the, you know, the problem might be that, for example, let's say you have an older game that, you know, the Activision Blizzard you know, obviously supports, people can still play it online with their friends, for example. Nevertheless, they're not watching it. They're not watching to make pe sure people aren't cheating, you know. And so uh, people are, you know, stopped from really being able to enjoy the older games and they might uh, dislike the franchise because of that, you know. So yeah, those types of things. And of course, new franchise, uh, you know, new versions of the game, that's a really big problem, right? If you're, if people are playing and they can't really enjoy it because other people are cheating, that's for sure a problem. And the serious risk, although I would I would guess that they pay quite close attention to newer games. So not the biggest risk, but definitely something to keep in mind. Okay, so in terms of what they mentioned, their relationship with the fact that they're a U.S. company and their relationship uh, with, uh, you know, uh, them and the United States or any other country could be a serious problem. And they obviously mentioned that they are looking at emerging markets in Asia. And so pretty much that's, as you read the whole paragraph, they are pretty much uh, trying to make sure that they can get the ability for uh, the Chinese people to be able to play their games. It's obviously, you know, a billion people. That's an enormous area where they can make money. Of course, it seems like in China, there's a negative attitude, attitude towards games. So it's not so clear how easy they'll have access. Nevertheless, lots of people do play games in China. I'm just saying the government has a negative attitude towards it. Um, uh, so, you know, it's a very tricky thing. They're trying to get their games into China. They're waiting for approval, you know, uh, how that works. And uh, especially with the trade war, and uh, it's very difficult. And we'll talk about it more, how even uh, people having the ability to speak freely on these games to other players you know, makes the chance that, for example, China allows them in uh, a little bit more problematic. Okay, nevertheless, like I said, we'll talk about that at a different time. They mention the fact that right here that people can post narrative comments in real time that are visible to other consumers or, you know, just the fact of videos, 
But like I said, we'll have to deal with the real life consequences and what actually happened um, later because this is, I think, addressing a specific issue for sure. Nevertheless, they have also this idea that, um, a risk, I should say, that there's laws and regulations and investigations related to protection from, for example, minors. And I think more specifically is, that's important is they mention gambling. Uh, they also mention other things like consumer privacy, accessibility, advertising, taxation, payments, intellectual property, distribution, antitrust, you know, all these other things. But I think the biggest issue in terms of regulation that they're worried about is uh, gambling. And that is because what are called um, loot boxes, but pretty much the idea is you allow a player to pay some sort of money, then they the game gives them, you know, on their screen, you know, this box or this bag or whatever. <laughs> it doesn't really matter how it shows up in my opinion. But anyway, these items pop out and some of them are really good. You have the chance of getting really valuable items that might in, uh, improve your ability to play the game. Um, and the problem is it's very close to gambling. And, you know, you have to argue is that, you know, is that gambling? Is that not gambling? And obviously there's a lot of back and forth. Nevertheless, a lot of people outside the gaming world see it as gambling. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the World Health Organization included gaming disorder as uh, part of their international classic classification of diseases. And so that's also not going to be useful for Blizzard and Activision in terms of, you know, what loops, uh, hoops do they have to jump through uh, to be able to sell their games. I don't think that any country will outlaw games that I think would be pretty um, extreme. But nevertheless, in terms of the gambling and those loot boxes, those have fallen out of favor anyway. But, you know, it's important to understand how these companies generate revenue and then sometimes regulators can stop in and uh, you know stop them and so something to keep an eye on okay now they also mention the fact that if there's uh, negative general uh, economic conditions or economic cycles you know people aren't going to be buying video games fair enough but uh, you know if that happens a lot of stocks could tumble uh, right now with bad economic conditions it's very possible people are in fact buying video games because you know what else do they have to do but i uh, nevertheless, important to mention the risk. Okay, so now let's get into some of the financial data, and uh, we're <laughs> running quite long, so we'll uh, we'll see how far we get into this before we have to stop and make another part to this. So, okay, so in 2019, we see that they made six and a half billion dollars in terms of net revenue, similar to 2016. In fact, a little bit less. So, you know, they haven't grown, quote unquote, in the past you know three years, except obviously it went up in between. Uh, in terms of operating cash flows, they've actually gone down since the, you know, they were better than last year, but worse than the two years before that. And we pretty much saw that already in terms of those graphs. Now, in terms of cash investments, we can see, you know, almost $6 billion, and that's more than they've pretty much had in the past four years. And we saw in that graph, I think, more than the past eight years, in fact. Okay, but, you know, I think that this is getting to something really important here when you read these 10Ks, 10Qs, whatever it might be, you know, they mentioned that they defer the transaction price. So let's say someone buys the video game, they're going to defer that transaction price. And what's the logic? Well, the logic is, for example, there's a lot of online functionality from the sale of these games. And so those revenues, uh, you know, they spread those revenues out because when you buy the game, you're actually buying the ability to play online sometimes for free. And so that's something that's ongoing. And so they'll that $60 will get spread out over, for example, a year. They say generally less than a year, but whatever the case might be. And uh, why is that important? Well, because when they look at total revenues, only 18% is point in time, meaning when you give that money, uh, they recognize it as revenue. Whereas overtime and other revenues uh, are 82% of total net revenues. So that is a huge difference in terms of when they're saying what their net revenues are, what is that actually from what someone paid this year? And to me, that's a really scary thing. Remember we spoke about before this idea that accountants allow kind of that smoothing of the money is that, so that line in terms of making money is kind of steadily growing. There's no bumps and no cliffs or anything like that. And so, you know, accountants get creative. People, sadly, in such situations commit fraud because they want to keep that number going up. And they think, oh, it's just a little 
deviation and we'll just massage the numbers it'll come back and then it doesn't come back and they start massaging more and there's you know everything kind of unravels on them and people say oh well why did you say that and well we thought you know anyway that's my rant <laughs> but the point is that this would really scare me away from any company that is going that far that only 18 percent of the money that they're getting is really being explained as net revenues that really scares me nevertheless the thing that doesn't scare me as much is elsewhere in the 10k Sadly, not on the next page, I don't think, but not that much further, nevertheless. They mentioned that they will tell you, for example, the revenues excluding the impact from deferrals. So, um, uh, you know, pretty much they're going to add that back in, meaning what is their actual, <laughs> what are their actual sales? So you can see that in from the previous year, uh, you know, they're down almost a billion dollars. Uh, so that's not great. Um, I mean, we kind of saw that anyway with the actual net revenue. But this way, we actually know in terms of what actual money is coming into the company. Uh, yes, it is down pretty much a billion dollars and without all of this deferral business and confusing. Um, so it's, it's a little bit scary when companies do this in my perspective. But, you know, at least they're somewhat forthcoming. Uh, so that's actually good. Okay, so now we're looking at what were those decreases of almost a billion dollars. So it's, you know, $600 million. Uh, that's A from Hearthstone uh, not doing as well. And also there's a World of Warcraft expansion not doing as well called Battle for Azeroth, I suppose, that was released in 2018. Um, and there was no comparable release in 2019. And so, you know, they're not making as much money from their perspective specifically for that reason that there's no new game that our people are buying and I suppose in-game content that people are buying. Um, nevertheless, they did have an increase from World of Warcraft Classic, which was released in 2019 because of subscription, people willing to pay to play that game. Um, so they did get some money, but obviously not <laughs> $600 million worth. Now there's also $240 million uh, decreased from Call of Duty, you know, just made less money, I suppose. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it's important to understand the amount of money that this company is worried about going up or down just because they don't have new games or new content or, you know, some other issue. Now, in terms of the international sales, they mention it's a little bit above 50%. Um, they mention, you know, Australia, Brazil, Canada, all these other countries. And so, once again, we mentioned in the last video, the U.S. dollar doing uh, poorly obviously will help them economically because all of this, all of their sales in all of these other countries, you know, more than 60%, it'll look like they're doing even more because previously they had to convert all of those currencies to US when they're, you know, posting their revenues. Now all of those sales, when they get post converted to US, will look like they're making even more US dollars because the US dollar is not faring as well. But this is actually, uh, I mean, although that's kind of surface level, of course, but nevertheless, um, this is actually very helpful. It means that their business can continue growing. And even though there's all these currency fluctuations, uh, they are able to, you know, depend on a lot of different currencies, a lot of different countries. And so even if there's problems in one country, you know, hopefully they can be offset with others. So I think that's actually a really big positive for this company and any company that's international. Okay, now they have what's called monthly active users. And uh, that's one of their key measures for the overall size of their user base. And how, do, how does it work? You know, they just measure, pretty much uh, measure logins and people using, I don't know exactly, but uh, it's not perfect. And so let's say you have two platforms or devices, uh, they might be counted as two different users, even though it's really the same person. Now that's really important to me uh, because that means that, for example, let's say you have a mobile, mobile user, you know, someone on their phone, and it's very likely if someone's playing the game, they paid $60 for the game, they might download the game for free on their phone, or maybe it's a dollar, I don't know exactly how each game is, how much it charges, but you know, that means that they can very easily double their users or whatever the case might be. Um, and so it's a little bit misleading in my perspective, my, my perspective, monthly active users, it might be something they could really easily bounce up. Um, so for example, let's look at this right here, December, uh, of 2019 compared to September of 2019, you know, that's only a few months difference. And nevertheless, they bumped up, you know, from 36 
million people to 128 million people for Activision. Um, you know, all the other numbers seem to be kind of roughly, they're always going up or down just by a few million. And so to go from 36 to 128 is, to me, massive. And maybe that's actually what happened. What's also happened, what's also possible is, like you see here, 2019, they launched Call of Duty Mobile, and also they have Call of Duty Modern Warfare. So what's possible? What I think is very possible is people from Call of Duty Modern Warfare, maybe they also bought the, uh, sorry, they, they were playing, you know, the previous version of Call of Duty. So, you know, compare that 36 million people in September, they logged in, they were playing that old game, and then now they're also going to log in, maybe they're also going to be playing this new game, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, maybe they're going to be playing both back and forth. They like this one, they don't like that one. There's bugs, like we said, there's not all the maps. And so now all of a sudden, the 36 million looks like 72 million. You've just doubled. Even though you have no more real extra users, there's just people playing maybe even the same amount of time. But since they're technically in two games, huh, well, look what just happened. And then, of course, the mobile edition is re uh, released. And so maybe those 36 million... You know, they also play on their phone, and so now that thirty, uh, that thirty-six, which jumped to seventy-two, now has jumped to one hundred and eight. So now you see you're kind of getting close to that one twenty-eight, uh, and maybe of course you picked up some new users because it's a new game and the new mobile game. Uh, now I'm not saying that this is all a lie. I'm just saying that it's very possible that those numbers will just drop down, and so if people are investing based off of the fact, wow, look at this massive rush of appeal and all these people moving in. Well, I think they might be mistaken and uh, very upset when that number drops back down to, let's say, 50 or 100 or whatever it might be, um, you know, it, because it could be very misleading. And even though really no one has played less or more uh, of the Activision franchise, you can see how that number can get pumped up. And so as an investor, yeah, it looks great. And obviously, they know how to write these documents, I think, uh, and really pump up their games and really give them a lot of status. And so investors will be pleased. And so on one hand, just like you might be pleased, whether or not, I'm not sure. But, you know, I like the idea that it's growing. Other people also like the idea that it's growing. The stock will grow. Um, but, you know, at one point, the truth catches up. And I think eventually that number will drop. Time will tell. I could be wrong. But that's one of these things that I would want to wait on to see another, you know, analyst report. Does that 128 really hold up? Or is there a lot of overlap and double counting and double dipping that they're not going to be able to keep doing because people will stop playing that old game and they're, you know, registering people more than once. Uh, so that's one of those things I'm scared of. The phone version, I'm not as scared of because when someone's playing on their phone, it's a time they're not going to be playing on their console. And so I think that's actually somewhat legitimate, in fact. Uh, it's just when someone's playing the old version of the game and the new version of the game, they're not really playing more than they would have. They're just switching. That, I think, is a little bit misleading. But I could be wrong, and this could be all legitimate, and there could be no double dipping here in terms of numbers, and really it's just that popular, which would actually be a really great sign. Okay. Um, now, in terms of their ability to expand their franchises outside the game, I think that this is actually a really, really positive thing. Um, you know, the idea that they have people who are engaged with their uh, intellectual property, people might be happy to buy things outside of the games, whether, of course, like things like t-shirts and things like that, but, you know, also uh, games, movies, all these other things, all these other avenues that this company can uh, go into. And even if they're just licensing their intellectual property to these other uh, areas and divisions to actually produce the content, you know, it's also something that they can actually make a lot of money. Although, once again, very risky because it could damage their perception uh, from the user base and the fan base. You know, they're not going to be uh, happy if they see something that's, you know, tarnishes their opinion of, you know, the characters or whatever it might be. Um, but nevertheless, I so, so they might have to do it themselves. But nevertheless really a positive thing that obviously the company is looking at uh, doing, but also a really positive thing in terms of them being able to grow their numbers and to expand into a bigger business. And of course, you know, someone who played the game, yes, they'll see the movie, but someone might just see the movie who's never played the game. And so they can get more people into the gaming world, whether you think that's good or bad, but they can get more consumers. 
uh, if they do that, possibly. Possibly, of course, they have to do a good job when they produce this other content. Okay, so that, that's, I think we're gonna stop here. We've done an enormous, enormous amount, um, and we'll have to keep going. This is a really powerful company, a really big company. This obviously takes me a long time, uh, first of all, in terms of research, all of this beforehand, and of course the recording. So please, uh, you know, subscribe or like the video, comment what you like, what you don't like, if you want these to somehow be shorter. Uh, yeah, we can try and do that. There's just so much information that I think is important when you're weighing your decision about this company uh, that I think it's really useful to be uh, aware of all the facts. What do they actually say? Where am I getting this from, of course? Um, so let me know. Let me know if you like it, uh, whatever it might be. There's going to be a few more parts to analyzing this company. Uh, I think it's really interesting. It's going to get um, you know, pretty dicey as well. Right now, as it stands, I think the company is looking really positive. They have what's eSports, you know, which we'll have to talk about, the ability for people to actually play, um, not just uh, with each other, but actually to make money playing. Uh, whether you like it or not, I think it's going to be a great source of revenue for this company and, of course, support the games as well. So, like I said, uh, let me know what you think. It's uh, very useful for me, and I really appreciate it, of course, as always, and I'm really here to just help you and other people, so it's you know helpful. It really motivates me the more people there are watching to uh, do this more and to actually be able to help other people with their investing and not just myself. Um, so thank you so much.